world of Japan itself in real life, let alone comic book movies, is completely different from anywhere else on the planet. There is this world of history and tradition and manners that is just the opposite of everything Wolverine stands for. It would be dishonorable for you to refuse this request. Well, apologize to Mr. Yashin. I'm not going to Tokyo. And Jim has really taken that to heart. There's a way to do fantasy, but to do it like it's real. And that synergy was what we were after. A lot of thought about use of color, unique locations. We wanted to dream big and see a lot of different kinds of things. Jim wanted to create kind of like a stylized, dreamy road trip for Logan to go on through Japan. So we really took that cue and went with it and kind of created a semi sort of magical, heightened reality that was also grounded and very, very believable. The look of this film kind of follows a bit of a roadmap. The X-Men franchise is kind of a terrific franchise, even going back to the very first film. I think it did a really great thing in terms of action films and comic book films, where it, it kind of based them in a certain amount of reality. It was a heightened reality, but it was definitely a reality. On this film, we've taken it a little bit further. The world that they exist in becomes a little bit more layered, very real, very kind of dramatic look. We filmed in Japan to make sure the movie looked authentic, that we actually had Japanese structure and architecture and people that would bring the movie alive and make it real. We wanted to render the environment properly as if we've taken you to a fictional world, as if we've taken you to a fantasy environment, but it has all the benefits of actually existing and being real and all the benefits for costume and production design and locations and all of that, that you can steep it in the detail that makes something feel real. Francois, our production designer and our director, spent a lot of time trying to bring modern Japan mixed with the ancient and the traditions of a classic and rich culture. We did a really heavy research push for the full-time researcher, and we just dived into every aspect of Japanese culture and architecture and society that we possibly could, and we fed that to Jim. He kind of folded those visual ideas into the script. It was a very collaborative and blended sort of creative process. We ended up scouting a lot in Tokyo. We went all over the place. And the movie's better for it, because we were able to be really, really scholarly about why and what we were shooting there that we'd never be able to recreate in the back lot. So exciting to be able to shoot in Japan. It is an incredible place to shoot. There is nowhere like it on the planet. It was very important for us to physically shoot there, even though we didn't shoot the entire film there. We shot quite a bit. The humanity of Japan is something that you don't get anywhere else. Yes, it's busy in Times Square. Yes, it's busy in, in London. Yes, it's busy in LA. But when you go to Shibuya Junction and you go to those places, it takes your breath away. You get the vision of the landscapes. You get the vision of the buildings. You also get to see rural Japan. We think of Japan mainly as kind of Tokyo, Osaka, these kind of urban areas. But there is some of the most beautiful wildlands and tropical islands. It's an incredible landscape once you go to some of the hinterlands in Japan and you begin to absorb the kind of rural culture, fishing culture that still exists. All of that had a huge effect on us. That seeps through into the whole movie. The movie really is this fish out of water story. It's Wolverine in this completely foreign place. He may as well be on Mars when he's in Japan. Too small too small. It's kind of this incredible world. The second films were capable of traveling and being shot on location. Movies became more international and people got to see different worlds. Japan, in the kind of technicolor glory in this film, is almost like Dorothy stepping out of her house in Oz. Color plays in a really interesting role in this movie. We wanted to really use color as a spice throughout the film. When we start out in Canada, it's very kind of subdued and organic. And then there's this big visual pop that happens when we get into Tokyo and there's this explosion of texture and graphics. I like to define a film by colors, the different environments or the different uh, places we are in the story. The production designer, the director of photography, and myself always work closely together to find a palette, the feel and the mood of the film and sharing our textiles and our different color plots that we have. I start with palette, and if I maintain that palette throughout the film, you will eventually, at the end of the film, feel those emotions for each of those characters. We find that in terms of characters, Wolverine is a very kind of earthy kind of character, so he kind of tends to exist in the sort of earthy tones. His wardrobe is, his makeup is. Essentially, Viper's color is green, so her environment and her wardrobe and, and the world she exists has a sort of slightly sort of green kind of tinge to it. Yukio is red. She's got red and gray and black. We have a lot of black in this film. There's a lot of black in the palette of the Japanese culture. Against it, a lot of bright 
very intense, beautiful fabrics and textiles in color. Mariko in a blue, which is a serene color. She's quite peaceful and innocent, and she's our ingenue. Part of the fun of doing this particular film is that we've moved into very many different genres and a different culture. Basically, 98% of it taking place in Japan. So the research of Japanese culture, Japanese traditions, Japanese clothing, kimono, akata, kendo, some of the martial arts having ninjas in there, yakuza. So all of that opens a whole new world for researching. In the Japanese culture, there are a lot of rules regarding dress, and we needed to learn all those rules. It's a challenge, but we used our Japanese cast to help us along the way with a culture that you can study from the outside, but they know it from inside and from living it throughout their lives. And that's what makes the film interesting. The beginning of our story takes place in World War II. It's Nagasaki, bombs about to drop. He was a prisoner of war at the time in a Japanese camp. So that's a whole other set of research. Pictures of Hiroshima during and pre in the POW camps and just getting it to feel real. And that is so incredibly well documented that we just had to go to history to do that properly. And then the rest of the film is set in present day. We start in the Yukon, which gives us North American kind of grit that we're more familiar with, and then moving into the Japanese culture. 15 hours, depending on the wind. The Japanese culture seeps into you, and you start to not only understand it, but appreciate it for what it is. And it is extraordinary. It's an unbelievable culture, and it is inspiring. So the effect that it had on me as an actor hopefully will translate through to the character. We are able to shoot in some of the more vibrant elements of the city and capture that. This Tibetan temple in the center of the city, you kind of can't believe it's in the center of all that is Tokyo. It's so vibrant and dynamic, and, and yet there in the center of the city is this ancient Buddhist temple. And they were kind enough to let us shoot there and give us the time to do that work properly, as well as a big chunk of the movie that we shot down in the south of Japan, which is in a much more rural sort of fishing village. And that's so much of what we wanted to reflect. We had great partners there, we're very lucky. It was really difficult to shoot in Japan and get all of the permits that you would need to do a compelling action sequence. But the Japanese crew kept encouraging us that it's okay, you have to sort of go for it. We had this sort of chunk in our schedule where the producers and Jim were like, take advantage of the locations we do have and trust the Japanese crew. It was old school. I mean, we waited for trains to fly through the background. We ran this sort of guerrilla second unit that helped us capture Japan, which few movies get to do. We're, you know, with our characters moving in and out of all the dynamism that is Tokyo subway or Tokyo streets or nights. We had a couple situations where you're running stunt guys through like a real crowd. And I mean, guys are falling down and people would stop and look and, and just keep carrying on. We honestly couldn't create those sets. We couldn't we couldn't imagine them. So really important for us to have figured out how to do that and, and make that a part of the film. Seeing the scope of the city in as a backdrop lends huge credibility to the movie and the world. That just helps us with any of the action sequences we're doing. This movie, more than I think anything I've worked on, has a lot of sort of cutting between locations in Japan and locations in Sydney and then sets in Sydney. And it's really interesting because when you see the scenes cut together, it actually makes the world appear much more immersive and much bigger and much more multi-layered. We did several weeks of photography in Tokyo and we did the rest in Sydney here at the Fox Studios where we took advantage of these world-class stages that are absolutely phenomenal. Right off the bat, we went right into a, quite a big set, which was the Yoshida compound. And this was everybody on the crew's favorite set because it really felt like we were stepping into another world. It was the world of incredible opulence and sophistication. You could just walk through these doors and all the rooms and hallways opened out into a central courtyard with water and trees, very zen and bonsai trees and rocks. And, and we even had plastic koi fish in the water just for that extra touch. And the crew loved it because everywhere they looked, it was like they were immediately in the world. And it was just kind of your fantasy to be able to create a space that was so unique. The set looks just incredible. It is full of layers and history and tradition. It has a very unique feeling. And then there's the Yoshida Lab, which is in the same stage, which is a giant, big, multi-story tower up in the mountains above in northern Japan. And it's Yoshida's 
private research and development assembly facility that he's shut down to divert resources into building this very elaborate and sophisticated biosuit that's keeping him alive, but it's also designed to battle and defeat Wolverine. Impressive, no? He's made of adamantium, just like you. The Silver Samurai in our movie is so exciting because it's difficult to find a formidable foe for Wolverine, but metaphorically, Wolverine is often battling himself, but in the Silver Samurai, there is a physicalization of that. It's a character that has lived famously in all the comics and something that people have wanted to see depicted on screen for years. The combination of being able to take that mythic, iconic character and yet build it out of something very real. You know, the Japanese society, the samurai culture. He's something that feels as if he's been dredged up from Japanese mythology. It's really like this almost robotic presence that feels a bit haunted. And so we came up with this idea of the silver samurai playing a bit of a mythical role within the world of the Yoshidas. That armor belonged to Shiraba Samurai, the silver samurai. It will stand watch over the old man forever. He sort of has this role of the final executioner, the person who will be the last thing you see before you die. Some of it's practical, but we're limited in that. Certainly all the action will be CG. Thankfully, we've got Weta, who I think is the best in the world at this. But it's as good a conceptual design for a character as I can remember seeing. The Silver Samurai is a full-size mechanical suit, fully posable prop that is completely detailed down to every single bolt head. A little bit of a nod to Japanese anime, perhaps, and Japanese technology and electronics. Its silhouette is meant to sort of recall a samurai silhouette, but at the same time, it's designed to tell you that it's more than just a robot. It's made up of over 600 parts that were all designed and modeled in the computer, and then most of them were grown using rapid prototyping technologies. They all had to be milled or sculpted. The majority of them are nickel-plated. Some are carbon fiber, some are matte black, some are copper, bronzed age. There's a lot of different levels of aging and finish. I have to say, it was a very, very ambitious build, and everyone's jaws hit the ground when we unveiled it in the middle of the lab because they didn't expect something that was so detailed. When you, know, you read it on the page, you think, Ah, that's gonna be CG, of course it'll be CG, but pretty cool that we had the opportunity to build a real nine-foot robot that kicks ass. In a movie which is not overladen with mutants, the Silver Samurai is stunning and extraordinary and really stands out. Hey! Up. <laughs> We approached the Yoshida Corporation as a real company, and so we had to create a backstory for that company, almost as if the company were a character in the movie. We figured out what the Yoshida Corporation made as products, and then what their entire style guide was. We had graphic designers here come up with an entire language and rule book for the Yoshida logo and the graphic language, so there was a consistency throughout the film for all of their products and their corporate identity. It's called a mon, and a mon is a family crest or emblem. And what we tried to do was to make a traditional yet modern, because that's what Yoshida Corporation is. It's a Panasonic, it's a Sony, it's Mitsubishi, it's big. We decided that the Yoshida Corporation was predominantly a medical electronics company, and you see that in Yoshida's suite in his house. He has a lot of Yoshida medical products that are keeping him alive. Kuzuri, you look the same. Then that is no surprise. One of the biggest challenges on the movie is we had to create this pin bed that Yoshida is lying on, which was an incredibly sophisticated piece of equipment. It was made up of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of individual pins that are each automated. And the idea is that this pin bed can sense you and sense almost read your mind, and then it manipulates like a pin cushion to raise you up into different positions. So it's a really interesting choice because the first time that we see Yoshida, it's against the backdrop of this sort of unsettling technology that he's lying on that's very, very kind of unusual and draws you in a little bit into this strange world that we're about to enter. We had some great big builds that were built on location here, like the Ice Village, which was designed based on actual villages in the mountains of Japan. We went to visit several villages and actually got blueprints from these Edo period houses that we based our architecture from. So it's very, very, very accurate architecture to these Japanese villages in the mountain. Originally, it was going to be shot on stage, but the set and the appetite for the stunt work grew and grew and grew. 
and we basically ran out of space on stage. So it went out to the outside. It wasn't easy recreating a mountainous snow village exterior at night, but it looked pretty good. What's amazing about this movie is it's a standalone film. So we could really have kind of carte blanche to do whatever we wanted because it had to be just true to the character and true to the story, which stood alone as its own thing. So it's kind of like Logan's personal journey. So we had a lot of freedom, much more freedom than I ever anticipated to just make it really, really cool.